Um, can you guys hear my sound now? Looks like I have a mic problem. Oh, you guys are hearing it? Oh, whew. I was pretty scared for a second. Okay, so people can hear my sound now? Okay, great. So, all right, so glad to hear that. Okay, the sound is working. Great. Um, so, yeah, what I was saying is, uh, so for this one, um, I am... Uh, I lost my train of thought. I was so freaked out that the sound wasn't working. Okay. Um, yeah, so so uh, currently you are not seeing my user interface. Um, for one, because it's crazy. And two, uh, because if I share my screen this way, you guys can see the uh, see-through effect. So if anybody really wants to see my UI, just let me know in the chat and I can pop it back up there for you. All right, cool. All right, well, let's get uh, started in on this. So um, today, my goal is to uh, really flesh out a lot more of the uh, more fine-tuned facial anatomy. And I also want to get into asymmetry, and I want to get his hairstyle applied. So without further ado, let's just jump right into it. Okay, so you might remember from last time we uh, Z-remeshed him and then uh, reprojected the details. So now that we've got a symmetrical mesh, it's going to be uh, capable to use posable symmetry. So this is going to make it um, a lot easier to uh, make asymmetrical changes and then continue to sculpt on this. So I'm turning on use posable symmetry. And of course, like always, I've got my reference images in a different monitor. And so uh, you're not seeing my reference images, but I am. And uh, I'm just going to be, you know, looking at those images and uh, going around and sculpting all kinds of different stuff on here. So um, some of the decisions that I have to make is what kind of facial expression I want to put him into, uh, because something that you might notice, depending on, uh, you know, different images of people, you know, they might be smiling in different ways, or they might have. You know, their eyes might be looking in different directions. They might have one eyebrow up or, um, you know, squinting or all kinds of different things. So uh, what I want to do is pick a reference image that is the one I want to go after. So the way I set this up, it's going to have to be a closed mouth uh, image just because I didn't create a, a hollow for the mouth. I mean, I could, I guess I could go in and like rebuild the topology for that, but uh, that's too much work. So <laughs> let's go with um, a different image here. So I'm just pulling up picture on the screen and so yeah I'll be turning the eyes to the side um, kind of pursing the lips a little bit more like this photo and um, it's kind of a serious expression and then we'll we'll also go into some stuff about um, slight caricature so that it looks more like him than him and it'll be so slight that uh, that you won't even notice it's caricatured, it'll still look like a realistic portrait. All right, so let's just jump in and uh, keep moving with this. I'm starting to notice some of the, the finer details in his face. Some of the, the little finer lines and little pockets of flesh. Everybody have a good weekend? Anybody do anything interesting?
Hey, Antonio. Thanks for the comment. This past weekend, I had the opportunity to go to some hot springs. It's one of my favorite things ever to do. Just outside of Portland. All right, I'm going to try to get some of this finer lip detail in here. Just getting the old crease brush out. Okay, I'm getting a request here from Srinivasan. Uh, he says, uh, use this menu and show us what it does. Brush, curve, curve by pen. Uh, yeah, let me see what that does. I'm not sure off the top of my head. Let's see, brush, curve, curve by pen. Interpolate curve by pen pressure. That is actually a really good question. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I've ever used this feature. I don't really see the difference. If anybody knows, um, feel free to comment in the chat.
So, so I'm using the move brush right now. This is actually one of my favorite ways to use it is by holding down alt. And so instead of moving uh, relative to the screen space, it moves relative to the, uh, the surface of the model. So pushing in and out. Hedel says, uh, how much time it takes to create a stylized character ready for production? Uh, it depends. I mean, there's all kinds of factors that go into it. You know, it's like, what kind of production is it? You know, how much budget do they have? Uh, how much time do they want to invest into you making that model? Um, depends on, is it a hero character? Is it a background character? Depends on... Uh, what kind of uh, production, you know, is it animation? Is it video game? Is it um, for TV commercial? Um, so yeah, a lot of factors go into it. So hard really to say, but you know, um, depending on, you know, where you're starting from too, you know, I mean, you might start from a stock model if it's a kind of a fast paced production and they just need to get something or if they want to just start from scratch and have you, you build the model from scratch. Um, so all those factors, you know, play into it could be anything from days to months. How much details going into it, you know? So yeah, it's really hard to say. Um, but, uh, yeah, typically, I mean, if you're working for a, um, like a production studio, I mean, they're just going to have a schedule and it's like, you've got three weeks and so you do it in three weeks. Um, if I'm doing something for myself, I just I just work on it till I'm happy and done with it. Really, no no real time frame on that. But good question. Hey, Goran's 007. Hey, 
<laughs> so I keep forgetting that I've got uh, symmetry either turned on or off. So like I'll be sculpting something I think is, you know, just for this one eye. And then I realize I have symmetry turned on, which kind of makes it look a little awkward on the other side, like with overlapping detail, but that's okay because, you know, the face is this organic thing. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. And so, uh, you know, if I just have to come in and like re-sculpt some things on this one side, that's okay. You know, all it, it kind of adds up and builds up like layers and shows like layers of your work. And, um, uh, it just, you know, gives it more character sometimes. So uh, I would say, you know, don't feel like you have to like, uh, get all the details right the first pass. Sometimes it's a process of like going over it and over it until you get it right. Hey, the Marco Kiyo. Greetings from Venezuela. Mucho gusto, Marco. Como estas? Qué bueno enterar que estás bien, Marco. Hey, Nightbot says, ZBrush Live sculpt off, call for artists. Oh, you guys get on that. What would I suggest for a good tutorial or something for sculpting likenesses in ZBrush? I would recommend my course on lynda.com and LinkedIn Learning. Search for uh, Ryan Kittleson on uh, either one of those platforms and you'll find it. And then I would uh, also just recommend good old practice. Uh, question, will I be in the sculpt off? I haven't signed up yet, but I, I believe I'm going to as soon as I get off of this live sculpt. Yeah, good good to hear, Gorans. Um, and how is that going? Are you feel like you're making progress? I know it's tricky sometimes to, to learn sculpting anatomy. It can be very complicated. One thing I will say about learning to sculpt anatomy, I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to go about it. Um, some people will like drill into you like the Latin names for every bit of anatomy and, you know, talk about insertion points and and uh, all that stuff and, and that's all great but I don't know that that's everybody's cup of tea I think some people um, well, well you need to like recognize the different anatomical features um, you don't necessarily have to learn the Latin names I mean I think it's it's very useful especially if you want to be working with other people and like pointing out things with other sculptors like you know Oh, I think you should move the uh, sternocleidomastoid like a little bit to the left or something like that. But uh, uh, for having like an artistic, I think you can become familiar with these forms and become friends with the, the anatomical forms uh, without necessarily knowing the Latin names. I think some people have like a visual memory, right? And they, they recognize where these shapes are placed and their relationships. Um, kind of on a more intuitive level, and that's fine too. Some people are, are very talented that way. Main Black Banner, Peter Falk. Uh, yeah, 
Yeah, totally. That, he's got a, such a great expressive face too. Uh, just, yeah, he's got a, such a sculptural face. Really great. Um, yeah, go for it. So Marco, I love the love hate relationship with anatomy. Yeah, yeah. It's um, I mean, it's kind of a never ending thing, right? You're never done learning it. Um, but hey, that's that's part of the fun of it is that it's it's always there for you to dive in and figure out more. I think studying anatomy is a must, but not necessarily uh, from the uh, a, like scientific perspective, right? Because like learning all the Latin names, um, that's kind of like a scientific perspective because there's a lot of um, traditional sculptors uh, and, and digital sculptors too, who aren't uh, scientifically uh, super accurate with anatomy or even that knowledgeable necessarily, but they're able to express something with their art anyway. Um, and that you typically find that more in fine art, <laughs> uh, less so in production. Um, uh, it's interesting. I feel like a lot of people who are coming to ZBrush are coming to it from a perspective of wanting to work in production in like games and movies, TV shows, visual effects, and that's wonderful. Um, but I think sometimes it gets forgotten that there's other ways to use it too. Um, fine art is a great way to do that. And in fine art, you know, it's much more forgiving if you don't know the anatomy as long as you're creating something expressive. <laughs> I got asked by uh, Al Howell. Uh, I've removed my ZBrush UI uh, for a couple reasons. Um, one is because in this video I wanted to use the see-through feature, and uh, I couldn't do that the way I had the the, the monitor set up before. And, uh, and not that I would say I got haters for for my UI. I mean I don't care. I'm I'm not saying anybody else has to use it, but. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's a lot, it takes up a lot of space in the interface and I don't know that like people were able to see it that well anyway. So might as well just show you the, the sculpt front and center. Uh, the proportions are more and important than the anatomy, right? Um, <laughs> it depends. I mean, it depends on what you're making. Um, but, but yeah, I guess by proportions, it's like the large scale forms and shapes is what you're referring to. And then, um, the anatomy is more like the, the everything smaller than that. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you get, I mean, in traditional sculpture, you know, they would definitely say like, get your proportions accurate before you start getting into, uh, finer detail stuff. With digital, you know, you can kind of change your mind at a later point and change the proportions after you've worked in some anatomy. It's not the most efficient way to work, but it can be done. Um, so, uh, yes, I mean, pay attention to both, you know. It's, it's what you want to create, right? I mean, there's a lot of um, cool art out there that plays with proportions and anatomy, you know, that breaks the rules. Uh, but you do, do you have to kind of learn the rules before you can break them effectively. So, um, you know, really it comes down to like, just practice, you know, find, find your workflow, find your style, do a lot of it, get feedback and, uh, change, change what's not working, keep what is, and just keep at it. Uh, just Nix. I use a uh, Wacom tablet. It's like the Intuos 5, I think. So some of this detail I'm sculpting isn't necessarily visible in my reference photos, but um, you know, it's stuff I've seen before in other people with this type of um, facial structure and age. And so it's kind of building it in for extra realism, even if it's maybe not like 100% accurate to this likeness.
Hey, Reficulous66, thanks for the comment. So there's a question if I use buttons on the stylus for rotating pan zoom or buttons on the table. I use, um, there's a plugin, a uh, middle button plugin. And so it, it kind of lets you use different schemes with your buttons for move, rotate, and scale. So I've got it set up so it works the same as the Maya defaults. Um, so, so yeah, I'm using the right stylus button for rotate and then, um, Alt right for zoom, and then Alt middle for pan. Yeah, Garan says he's, he uh, starts out by blocking anatomy with like different objects, like one for the torso, one for the legs, one for the arms. That is totally valid way to do it. And then uh, when you've got it to a place where the proportions are feeling good, then you can just, um, you know, like dynamesh it together or something. So yeah, that's totally valid. I actually work like that sometimes, especially for cartoony characters. Yeah, yeah, the Marco. So it's, it is difficult to learn the correct volumes. And so uh, that it, it just kind of takes practice. And one thing you want to do for that is you want to constantly be looking at your model um, kind of in silhouette, right? And so uh, looking at this edge as you're rotating your model around and you can see how the form changes and then you can see like where weird awkward things are happening and uh, that, that can help a lot with, uh, with, uh, with getting your volumes correct. And then some of it is just, it's kind of like a, like just a 3D visual sense that you'll probably develop over time by doing enough of it where you just kind of feel the, the volume. I did get a, a request in to look at a beginner's work here. Uh, I'll quickly take a look at it. Anybody else has any, any things? Uh, you can go ahead and send them over. Uh, so uh, a beginner head. So um, there's not a lot to say here other than um, keep practicing. You know, I think it's, uh, you're just beginning. And so it's going to be difficult. And, um, you know, I think you've probably got like several, several more attempts in you uh, before there's really anything solid to, um, to talk about. Um, you know, study anatomy, study the structures of the face get more comfortable with sculpting uh, keep at it and uh, once you've done like t 10 more of them like put in an hour each into 10 more of them and uh, then go ahead and, and share what you got and uh, we'll take a look at it yeah the name of the uh, the plugin is middle button I'm a big fan of it. Um, oh, and also uh, Cheserx, <laughs> uh, uh, huge fan of Ryan's tools. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'm actually gonna put in a link to Ryan's tools in the chat right now. That's my personal plugin. Uh, go ahead and check out that link. Uh, there's a, you can get the older versions for free, newer versions paid, um, especially uh, for professionals.
I feel like there's kind of two phases to sculpting anatomy. One is the uh, block out phase, and you're just getting all of the, the proportions and the, the basic anatomy in. And then there's the refine phase. Refine phase goes much slower. It's maybe not as exciting, but it's, uh, it's definitely uh, crucial if you want to bring your, your work all the way to the finish line. <laughs> Thanks, Luck Lori. And yes, those those lips are quite detailed. Yeah, it's interesting as you as you work, you know, it's like some parts of the model get ahead of others, which is fine. So the Marco, the, the question, uh, is it is it me that I'm sculpting? This is not a, a, um, a self-portrait. This is uh, Anthony Fauci. I know you're from Venezuela, so I don't know uh, how well people outside the United States know Anthony Fauci, but he's, um, what is it, the director of the CDC, is it? Uh, anyway, he's, he's the, the main guy in the United States who, who uh, is uh, uh, about um, COVID policy. So uh, Rafikulus asks if um, it's useful to start working with a mouse, even if you don't have a tablet yet. Uh, sure, it can't hurt. You know, I think uh, doing something is better than nothing. But I think uh, if you really want to sculpt, you should get a tablet. I have heard mythological stories of people who do really amazing work with just a mouse. I don't know how I could do it. It's uh, way better to have a tablet, in my opinion. But I mean, if you even if you're maybe not like getting really into the sculpting with just a mouse, it's still useful to just start making stuff because you're still going to, you know, learn the interface better. You're going to be learning the tools of ZBrush better and you'll just be um, that much more ahead when it's, when you actually get your tablet. Um, I've heard good things about some uh, non Wacom tablets. Uh, Wacom definitely had kind of a monopoly for a while, but there's some competitors now that uh, uh, I've heard good things about. So if the price of a Wacom is intimidating, um, I think there's one, uh, actually I can't remember names off the top of my head. Huyan I think is one of them. I think it's Chinese. Oh, yeah, he's not the head of the CDC. He's the chief medical advisor to the president. Uh, Rafikulus asks, does it matter if it's a uh, like a tablet with a screen in it, like the Cintiq, or if it's a tablet that doesn't have a screen in it? Um, so that's a good question that comes up all the time. Uh, I, it comes right down to your personal preference. However, I would say start if, if you don't, uh, if you don't know, I would say just get a regular tablet. Um, and the reason for that is they cost less and, um, there's, there's some complaints I have with the Cintiq and other tablets with screen. Um, one of them is that like your hand is always covering up part of the screen, uh, and you're like smudging the screen or whatever, but then also, uh, you know, you, you've got to place the screen in a place, where, um, right. But with my, 
monitor and my Wacom tablet the way I have it set up right now, my monitor isn't a place that's like perfect for me to look at um, for my like posture with my neck and head. And my sculpting tablet is in a place that's really good for my hand. And then my eye-hand coordination is like perfectly synced up with my cursor on my screen. So, so there's really no reason for me to get a Cintiq. Um, but some people, some people like it, you know, like, so with a Cintiq, your ergonomics, in my opinion, are all out of whack because you got to put the screen somewhere. If it's comfortable for your head and neck, you have to lift your arm way up and your arm gets tired. Um, if it's in a place where it's comfortable for your arm, then you have to be like hunched over and it's not comfortable for your head and neck. So, uh, I just don't really see the benefit of it. <laughs> so a comment about sculpting hair, um, using fiber mesh or polygons. I mean, it depends on what your output is for, you know, if it's like production, usually you're going to not be using fiber mesh because there's some sort of like hair system in, in whatever animation software they're using. Um, if it's just for your own personal work, I mean, do whatever works for you. Uh, I typically don't like fiber mesh for things where I have to like art direct it closely. You know, if it's just like some grass sprouting out, it's fine. But like hair where it like there's like a flow to the hair and there's like a style and there's like all kinds of different things going on. Like it's long on the top and it's short on the sides. Like managing all that with fiber mesh is very cumbersome to me. Um, I, so when I get into the hair on this, I'm going to actually be doing sculpted hair. So I'm just going to sculpt right onto this mesh and I'm going to be using a special brush that I made, which is part of Ryan's Tools Pro. A little plug there. If you want to pick that up, I've got a special brush that's uh, really great for uh, especially this type of short hair that this guy has. Um, I actually used it on these eyebrows, just kind of roughed in the eyebrows. I'm going to uh, put in a little bit more work into these later, but uh, just roughed in the eyebrows with that special brush. All right, Comics Legend um, is asking about uh, balancing personal work with professional work. Uh, how do you do it without getting burnt out? Uh, well, that's a, that's a actually a really good question. There's a lot to talk about there. So, um, yeah, I, I do my own personal work as well, but I also work professionally and it is a, an issue because you're working all day professionally. And then sometimes the last thing I want to do at the end of the day is like, keep looking at a computer screen. Um, and so it kind of makes it hard to get some personal work done that way. Um, so there's a couple things I do. Uh, one of them is, uh, well, I'm fortunate enough to be a freelancer so I can kind of pick and choose my own schedule and I can, you know, uh, turn down work if it's just going to be too much and like burn me out. Cause I don't want to get burned out. I don't think anybody wants to get burned out. So, you know, if, if that starts to happen, I can just back off the amount of work I'm taking on. Um, I know not everybody's in that kind of situation. Um, you know, I've worked in studios before, you know, sometimes they, you know, they're working you 10 hour days. It could be even more in the crunch time and, um, you know, burnout really happens. Um, so I typically don't like to work in studios for that reason. I just like really value my, my freedom, my independence, my free time, like being able to do, uh, the kind of work I want to do. Uh, one thing I started doing is uh, sort of creative outlet things for my own personal creative time that are not visual art based uh, to just totally change up, you know, what I'm doing creatively outside of work. So I actually started getting into stand up comedy a couple weeks or months ago. And uh, so it's totally different. It's, you know, it's a performance art rather than visual art. It's verbal rather than visual. Um, and it's, uh, it's still creative, it's still fun. And it's just a, like a fun thing to do. Um, when I'm not sculpting, definitely not making any money at it. And I nor do I anticipate making money at it ever. Um, but it's a fun thing to do.
So someone put up a link of uh, something they use for learning proportions. I'm going to load that up and we'll see. Oh, actually, I have to log into Discord to do that. I don't have time to deal with that. Sorry. Maybe some other time. Hey, Akilesh, thanks for the comment. Okay, so someone, uh, Goran's posted this as a, as a way to learn proportions. So yeah, like a, like a person is, uh, what is it? Seven and a half heads tall or something. One, two, three. Yeah. Seven and a half. But yeah. That's the average person, you know, but uh, this is definitely one thing you can do. Like if you want to measure out, you know, proportions, um, yeah, if, if it works for you, that, that and if it helps you get good proportions, that's definitely something you can do. I think eventually, you know, I, I personally, wouldn't do that anymore just because like my sense of proportions have been internalized so much that you know I, I just look at it and I know if it's right or wrong um but uh yeah as a way to like learn and sort of like internalize those things uh, it can't hurt so there's a question where do I get freelance work uh do customers contact me directly uh yes yeah. so um so I got on like the YouTube bandwagon pretty early on and that was pretty fortunate because um, I started picking up a lot of freelance clients through that. Now it's a lot harder to do that now that like the entire universe is making uh, things on YouTube constantly and there's like more content uploaded every day than you could watch in the rest of your life. But um, that, that helped me build up a, uh, a freelance client base uh, about almost eight years ago now I moved to New York City and um, I was really I got into 3d printing into the 3d printing community there and uh, got a lot of freelance clients that way and then so when I moved away from New York City I was able to keep working with them from home and uh, so that was that turned out to be a really like a really good way to to keep clients going and then just like word of mouth so you know my clients are artists they know other artists those people need work done and uh and then they I, I just get connected that way so um you know don't ignore uh really any opportunity really to get your work out there i mean everybody does it different ways you know some people do a lot of networking some people um you know posting their work online all the time some people are uh, making tutorials they get noticed that way you know, like I, I have a lot of tutorials. So what will happen a lot of times is um, people, some some small business will start up and they want to start making a, a tabletop game or something. And they're like, oh, we're just going to, you know, watch this tutorial and we'll learn how to make our, our 3D printed characters and items for this game. And then they start getting into it and they realize, oh, wow, ZBrush is a lot more complicated than I thought. Maybe I'll just pay this guy to make this stuff for me instead because uh, I just can't do it myself. And that's that's probably one of the benefits of ZBrush having a, a, a tricky UI is that uh, a lot of people just give up. And that means uh, I get to take their work. <laughs> nice joke, Reficulous. I haven't used Blender in a long time. It's also it's been like eight years since I've really opened up Blender seriously. Um, I was actually pretty impressed with it at the time. At the time, it had better retopology tools than Maya, and so and and also ZBrush because ZBrush didn't really have uh, great re any retopology tools either. So um, kind of Blender was the best way to do it for a, a brief window in history, and so I did jump into Blender for a, a while back then.
Okay, so we're almost an hour in today. Man, time flies. Okay, so I, yeah, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here with uh, facial stuff. We'll get back into that later. I'm going to jump into the hair now. So let me show you guys what I do for hair. So uh, I like to mask off uh, where the hair is going to be. So I'm just going to kind of rough in uh, where the hair goes and then I can just adjust this mask later. But I just want to get kind of the basic thing in here and then um, then we'll come in and, and like refine the shape of this a little bit. Good thing I set up poly groups for that ear, huh? <laughs> Sadicus, am I using the jowl brush? For hair, I use a hat. You should do stand-up comedy, Sadicus. Hey, Jupiter Webster, I am doing fantastic. How about you? Nice to see you dropping in. It's kind of hard to see his hair shape from some of the photos I'm looking at on my other monitor, so I'm just taking a peek here at this one. Okay, it's got kind of like a part, but it's not really well defined. So that'll be interesting to sculpt in. We'll get it. And I don't have to nail the, the shape of this hairline perfectly. And what's interesting about sculpting the hair on is we can get this really nice fine feathered transition from the hair to the scalp. just hid my mask it's still there it's just hidden all right so my special brush for hair is one I made myself it's called the short hair brush and um, we'll just I'm gonna do a little test with this okay it looks like the size is pretty good on that so I'm just gonna undo that test and then we'll we'll do it for real here in just a second I'm just gonna blur my mask a little bit all right and I'm just gonna jump in and start sculpting this hair on Actually, you know what? Before I do that, I'm going to actually use a different brush to get kind of the basic. Uh, it's another brush I made actually called Clay Hair. And so this one, it's a little bit more like rougher. It's not like uh, finer, it's not fine hair structures, but it's, it's kind of like the, the bigger gestural uh, shapes of things. So I'm just gonna build up the volume of the hair a little bit with this one first. And, and establish how the hair flows on the head. 
so I'm actually not creating the hair on a layer. I'm just masking off. I just go into town. I think if I were doing this um, like for production where I just like really needed to keep everything organized really well, uh, I probably would put the hair on a layer, but because it's, you know, personal project, it's something that's going to remain a little bit quick and dirty. I'm not going to have to like take this into Maya and do any like fancy rendering or animations on it. Um, I'm just going to kind of go a little faster and just skip some of the steps I might do for production, like putting the hair on a layer. So yeah, this, this brush is one of my custom brushes. Um, it's, I call it clay hair and it's, um, I want to say it's based on a rake brush, but with like a, I, I, I changed some of the things about it, customized it, uh, made it good for, for sculpting out rough hair. And to a large extent, this is right now what I'm doing is for getting the volume of the hair and also uh, establishing the direction and flow of it. All right, now that I've got the um, basic proportions of the hair in place, I'm going to switch to the short hair brush. And I'm going to start putting on some of these finer hairs.
Hey, Sam Media, glad you could join. What's new? Thanks, Sam. No, I'm not going to use hair planes for this one. Uh, all kinds of different ways to make hair. You know, I figure since this is a personal project, um, we're just going to go sculpted hair. I just want something that. Uh, Gets a good feeling, but isn't necessarily like something you would actually use in production, which is fine. And, you know, even even if uh, so, even in production, they're probably not going to use sculpted hair. <clears throat> but uh, depending on the budget they have and the time they want to spend on it and depending on what the character is, uh, it's very possible that, you know, someone working as a ZBrush artist uh, would be asked to sculpt the hair to, uh, to sort of concept the hairstyle. Uh, so sculpted hair is like the fastest way to make a hairstyle. So it's actually, um, it's a good skill to learn how to do it because uh, you could definitely be asked to do it. And it's a great way to block out hairstyles. Great way to get a sense of what a hairstyle is going to look like before investing the time and energy into doing like a a real hair simulation or um, hair cards, hair planes. So uh, Sam asked, will it look realistic as well? Uh, I assume you're referring to the hair. Uh, the hair, you know, uh, for this, I'm not, I'm not going for like a hyper realistic render in the end, uh, just, you know, just going for the sculpt. So um, the hair won't look, you know, perfectly realistic. It's, it's going to look like sculpted hair, but um, as far as just making a sculpture, uh, I think it's gonna end up looking pretty good. Okay, so now that I've got the hair uh, pretty well established, I'm going to remove the masking that I had, and now I'm gonna do some like fading and blending to uh, make this feather out, you know, onto the, the scalp.
Um, actually, I think this is this is a time where using layers could have come in handy because then I could have like um, uh, sort of used uh, morph targets to um, revert. Actually, I probably should have started started a morph target, stored a morph target before I did the hair, so I could like use the the morph brush to like fade that back. But that's okay. Sometimes doing it the more manual way is uh, is just as good. Um, and actually, sometimes the manual way results in uh, some more organic uh, detail that you wouldn't get otherwise. So uh, I wouldn't say all is lost. Oh, actually, I did store a morph target and I forgot about it. Okay, actually, so I'm going to go back before I smooth some of that stuff out. And let's see, I'm going to use my morph. And just try to feather this out a little bit. All right, so now what I'm going to do is uh, try to put in some some specific detail. So I'm just using my crease brush, and um, you know, in some specific parts of it, just want to add a little bit of uh, more intentional detail, so that it looks a little bit more organic and less stamped on. Some individual hairs here. So Noah Gomez says sculpting hair is hard. He doesn't know why. Uh, well, it's uh, it's definitely one of those things that nobody nails their first try.
it's I mean it's also because like there's so many different shapes that hair can take that there's you can't just learn one hairstyle and be good to go so it uh, it takes practice you know wavy hair curly hair short hair spiky hair smooth hair it just it's just the variations never end so it's it's actually a really really cool challenge you know every once in a while i find myself facing a hairstyle i've never done before and it's it's kind of like okay just jump in and like try three different things and see you know one of them kind of works okay so i'll take that approach that i use for the one that kind of works and i'll start over and uh, hopefully learn from the first pass maybe combine it with a couple different techniques so yeah you definitely can't beat yourself up if hair is a, a problem just keep with it One thing with hair that I like to try to do is um, use very inconsistent strokes, right? So if you make all your strokes the same, like this, you know, it's going to start to look artificial. So I'm just going to undo that. And so you're know, just trying to be intentional about like changing up the placement of them, changing up the intensity, changing up the length. Helps it feel more natural changing the direction too. change the spacing. Someone asks what uh, kind of hardware I've got. Uh, I've got a fairly high end gaming laptop from MSI. It's uh, not like the craziest workstation it's uh, just like a medium high grade gaming laptop so i want to say it cost me about it about two and a half maybe almost three years ago and i want to say it costs in the neighborhood of two and a half three thousand dollars so yeah definitely not like a super expensive workstation you know those can run six thousand and up but uh, for ZBrush, I mean, it, this, this laptop, it, uh, for pretty much everything I want to do, it runs great. I've got, I think, 32 gigs of RAM. Um, it's like a i7 four, uh, quad core processor. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good for a gaming laptop, but it's not like the the craziest, most expensive workstation, for sure. It's a good question, Noah. Uh, for hair, I'm using some custom brushes that I made. Uh, they're part of the Ryan's Tools Pro download. They're like these extras that come with the download. So uh, if you wanna get these hair brushes, Right now I'm using my crease brush. Um, it's, it's like kind of like the uh, Damien standard, but it's I like it better. I think it makes a smoother uh, stroke, cleaner line. Um, I made it, oh my goodness, 12 years ago. Um, 
before the Damien standard came out. So yeah, I do some 3D animation. Um, some of my professional work, um, you know, goes into animation. I'm part of a studio, of course, so I'm I'm not doing the animation for that. Although I have done some animation professionally, uh, it's definitely not my focus. Um, I've also done some animation for my own personal projects, uh, which is super fun. I love I love 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 doing animation. Uh, it would be cool to do more of it, but there's only so much time in the day. Too many things I want to do with my life. It's hard to fit it all in. Oh, do I use my laptop for animation? Um, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, what little animation I do here and there, yeah. Yeah, I use it. Now there's a question, am I not a fan of Apple computers? Not really, I mean, I'm not a hater. Um, it's just, uh, I like I like the Windows ecosystem. I mean, well, I, honestly, they have a lot of problems with the Windows ecosystem too. Uh, but um, it's what I'm used to. I personally prefer I like the fact that it's an open ecosystem um, rather than having it be monopolized by one company. Uh, but that's just kind of a personal preference. Oh no, I got uh, random stray hairs showing up. How did that happen? So unsightly. Okay, so this is moving along. Um, here's an interesting thing. So uh, after the last screen share, uh, I did some, uh, I actually did a, a cap hair. So let me see if I can, so let me turn that on and just compare the difference. Uh, let me see if I can, yeah. So ignore the details going away on the face, but yeah, I had done this like cap hair as a quick quick and dirty test to see what that would look like. The thing I don't like about it so much is that when the hair is a separate object from the head, you're always gonna have kind of a harsh transition between the two. Um, and so I wanted something a little more unified and, and um, uh, kind of s solid in one shape. So we'll just delete that cap hair, not a fan of it anyway. Uh, also got the eyes. Um, so also since uh, sort of in between, um, I just made some quick eyeballs. So I just took a, a plain old, you know, polysphere and um, just kind of pushed part of it in, and extruded a, a pupil in. So you just get a simple eye and then so here's another trick I like to do um, so with Ryan's tools what you can do is you can mask a, a place right and then there's a uh, okay so it didn't work oh that's why I had, I had symmetry on hold on real quick okay so so 
I'm just going to mask off. Oh, <laughs> I was confused for a second. So yeah, my eyes are, um, um, they're an instance, they're a mirrored instance. So I was getting some weird effects that I wasn't expecting, but no matter. Anyway, just popping in a sphere with Ryan's tools. And then what you can do is you can place this um, as a kind of a neat little sculptural trick. It kind of like mimics the effect of light hitting the, um, oh, I forgot the name of it, with the clear part of the eye, the, the lens, right? So it kind of like breathes a little bit more life into the eyes. Comics legend ask, what's my comedic inspiration? Uh, the weirdness of everyday life is my comedic inspiration. Uh, I have some favorite comedians. I like um, Mitch Hedberg. I like um, um, Tom Segura. I like Duncan Trussell. Sadika says, if purchasing the Ryan's Tool Pro version, you show up at my house and sculpt for me? <laughs> Not even close. If you want to pay me by the hour, I'll show up and sculpt for you. All right, so now we've got hair in place, we've got eyeballs, we've got a lot of the details fleshed out. Um, definitely could keep going, you know, with, with more of the anatomical little nuances and every little fleshy bit, but um, we can also keep doing that later. So for right now, I'm going to jump into um, getting a little bit more of like a facial expression and some asymmetry worked into this. So I'm um, just kind of looking at some of my different photos here and uh, seeing maybe what I want to do with this. Okay, so I'm gonna give him just a slight little smile, a little bit more than he's got going on here. And so on my move brush, I've got AccuCurve turned on. So uh, AccuCurve, it has a cool little effect of like pulling out, um, but like with a point on it. So you can change um, how that curve is formed here under uh, curve, right? With Accu Curve turned on, um, you could actually make the curve anything you wanted to. But uh, for the most part, I like to leave it like this. So I'm just kind of pull up the mouth a little bit, and then I'll start doing it asymmetrically. You know, maybe maybe smirk this side up just a little bit more and then play with uh, the eyebrows a little bit, so. You know, like, sort of counterbalancing it. So like smirk up on this side, but also eyebrow down on the other, on the same side. So it, it kind of um, accentuates that a little bit. All right, so I also said I was going to get into some uh, stylization caricature. So I'm not going to push it very far. I'm actually going to just, just do the slightest little bit of caricature for him. So, uh, so some of the things you might notice about him, what stands out about his face, you know? Maybe he's got uh, his eyes seem a little smaller than the average person. Uh, his ears maybe are a little bit more like um, kind of sticking out to the side than the average person. Maybe his mouth is a little bit more like thin 
than the average person. So and it, maybe, maybe the tip of his nose bulges more than the average person. So these are some things we can uh, slightly exaggerate and um, hopefully it'll end up looking more, more Fauci. -y. So first I'm gonna make his eyes just a little bit smaller. So let's just mask off the eyes. And then I'm gonna do do just a little shrink of the eyes here. And then also Let's, let's take the ears and angle them out a little bit. And let's make his mouth a little bit more thin. Actually, I'm gonna do it this way, just mask it off. Scrunch it down a little bit. Let's get a little bit more uniqueness into his eyebrows too. So just taking my crease brush and just kind of sculpting in a few more, uh, more well-defined hairs. I'll just kind of like help pop out these eyebrows a little bit. All right, let's get into uh, some more of the like the facial uh, fine detail stuff. Um, so he's got some some little like uh, moles or little bumps on his skin. So I'm just gonna get out my clay brush and just kind of sculpt some of those in. Gilad asks if I've made any NFTs. No, I personally, I am skeptical of NFTs. Um, some of my clients have turned artworks into NFTs, some of the works that I've worked on with them. Um, but hey, they, they're the ones that have to cover the cost of minting it, not me. They're, they're welcome to, to blow their money on that if they want to. I, I'm a little bit skeptical of it. Oh, there's a question. How did I change the gizmo? Um, so yeah, there's a there's a um, there's a way to do it. There's a it's actually just a ZTL file that's um, under the ZBrush installation folder. Um, there's the gizmo, uh, and so what you want to do is you want to open it up, and uh, there's different subtools. Like one of the subtools is for the you know the X uh, translate and the X. Uh, rotate X scale and there's Y and Z and then there's like the 
the screen space rotate and the overall scale. And so they're all different subtools. And so what you can do is just um, change the, what the shape of the subtool is. And uh, it also has to be the exact same RGB color. And then um, you just open that up into preferences and gizmo 3D. And then you, as long as what, whatever ZTL gizmos are saved in that folder um, can just be loaded up here. So there's like next gizmo. I think this is the, um, the default one. Yeah, and I deleted the others because I don't like the other ones that come with ZBrush. So I just use like the, the default one if I'm making a training video. And then I'll just use my own personal one that I like better uh, for my own stuff. Gonna make his nose a little bit more bulbous. Have I tested uh, 20, 21 brush techniques such as thick skin? Yeah, I played around with them a little bit. Um, I haven't really found a great reason to use them yet, but um, I'm sure they're in there somewhere. Oh yeah, actually here's kind of a major feature I kind of forgot about, uh, his uh, forehead wrinkles. So I'm gonna put these in just kind of manual freehand style. Let's see how this works. So I'm using a clay brush with a uh, an alpha that kind of rounds out the shape a little bit. And then I'm going to go back in with um, a crease brush and kind of define some of these, these creases a little bit more tightly. Have I sculpted in VR? Um, a little bit. I have a VR headset. I've got the uh, Valve Index. Um, it's cool. Yeah, I played around with, uh, what is it, Gravity Sketch and um, uh, there's the, what's the other one? Um, yeah, I played around with those. It's okay. I like, I'm, I'm so familiar with the ZBrush interface that it, while it was cool to sculpt in VR, uh, I just felt like much slower than I would have been um, in ZBrush. So we'll see. Maybe ZBrush will have a VR version one day. So the question is why Fauci? Um, you know, it's, it's uh, actually had a freelance client wanted a bust of Fauci made and uh, figured why not kill two birds with one stone and make it a live stream.
if I'm sculpting him, I have to tell him, I have to, I gotta tell you what I think of him. I don't have to. Uh, I don't have any strong opinions one way or the other. He's in a very difficult uh, position, uh, difficult political position. Uh, Yeah, I don't really have any strong opinions about him. Hey, Delonic. All right, let's get some of the more uh, nitty gritty skin details in here. Okay, so I've got this, uh, it's based on the actually the short hairbrush, um, but what I'm gonna do is uh, decrease its intensity, decrease the size, and um, make it push inwards. So it's gonna create this kind of subtle effect. Um, just playing with some of the brush settings here, I'm trying to dial this in. And so what this does is uh, it creates the effect of, so like the skin where there's, where the skin gets compressed, like around the eyes, especially on the forehead. Um, what you see is uh, little skin wrinkles that, f that form uh, with a direction to them. So I'm just going to come in here and uh, sculpt some of this stuff on. That's an interesting theory you have there, Gilad. Very, very interesting. You should be a writer for the X-Files. How long will Fauci take from start to finish? Um, so I've put about almost four hours into it so far. Um, I'm gonna get, I think maybe the next live stream. I don't know, I depending on where I end up today, I might just call it finished and then we'll start a different project next live stream. Or if I feel like there's, there's a significant amount more to do on him then uh, uh, maybe we'll uh, just continue him in the next one. That's cool that you write sci-fi, Gilad. Have you written anything that you've, you've put online? Or that uh, anybody might have read or seen?
All right, so I'm gonna use a different brush here. I'm gonna put in some uh, skin bump type detail. <laughs> Will this sculpt be a Pez collectible? Uh, actually, that's a great idea. Like a little Pez figurine head, just pop open the mouth and the outcomes of vaccine pill. That'd be a great idea. Hey, Delonic. Uh, yeah, cool. Hey, glad to see uh, some old full sale people popping in here. Um, I'm not sure uh, who you are from the username Delonic, but uh, glad glad you're stopping in. Go ahead and uh, blow up my email if you want to. Would be cool to to uh, hear from you. But I definitely got a lot of experience with wrinkles. So I like to mix up my uh, sort of automatic spray on wrinkles with some more intentionally sculpted wrinkles. Really helps pop out uh, some some details. If the detail is like too uniform all over, you know, it starts to look lifeless. So uh, you want to maybe come back in and like pick a few little spots to to really sharpen up, so you get um, a variation of like heavier creases and lighter creases.
All right, so let's see, we've got 15 minutes left. I'm gonna do one other fun little thing here. I'm gonna turn him into a cube. Just kidding. So uh, what I'm gonna do is use this as like a bust, like kind of make him look like a, a marble bust that's been broken off, right? And so what we can do is we can put some noise on this cube and make it a uh, Boolean subtraction. Combining a little bit of erosion noise with basic noise. And we're going to make this cube a subtraction object. And then what we can do is subdivide the cube quite a bit and then apply that noise, and then it's really gonna uh, make a nice effect of like breaking off. Let's see, where do I want that break off point to happen? Yeah, that looks pretty good. There's a little bit of a weird like viewport glitch with the, the live Boolean, but if I were to um, actually uh, Boolean up the object so it locks in that, that change, then those artifacts would go away. But uh, yeah, looks like he was sculpted out of marble and then his head knocked off. So sad. All right, let's do a little bit more with the eyes, actually. I'm gonna sculpt in some of his cornea detail. A question uh, from Gilad: What's my favorite thing to sculpt? Uh, I love cartoony characters, so I think uh, my next one I'm going to do a cartoony character. Yeah, I feel like I've got far enough with this Fauci sculpt today that uh, there's really not enough to do on it for another video. So yeah, next time I'll do a cartoony character. If anybody has any recommendations, suggestions, you got any like uh, requests? 
you want to send me a photo, just go ahead and email that to me, ryankittleson at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll use it, maybe I won't. Um, but, uh, yeah, it could be cool. So many different ways you could do this sculpting of the cornea. Um, you know, you could project things with alphas. Um, there's probably some brush that just pops it in. You know, there's probably pre-made eyeballs. You know, there I know there are. I could probably just pop in a pre-made eyeball. But you know, there's something to be said for just manually doing something. Just taking the low-tech approach and just sculpt it manually. Um, I'm actually a fan of it. It's, you know, it can give your work more vitality, you know, instead of looking like the same thing that's been stamped out a million times. Um, you can give it more of a, a unique personality, more style. So um, definitely a fan of just, just doing it manually. Oh, he's got a uh, a vein. He's got some veins actually on his face. I just want to kind of get those in. Little forehead veins. And all this stuff just adds that little extra bit of realism detail. You know, and, and uh, maybe some just like random little bumps, you know, as you get on your skin, just some little bumps that who knows what they mean, what they are, but they just kind of add that little extra bit of realism. So the question is, uh, will this task be replace replaced by 3D scanners and AI soon? Um, realistic head sculpting specifically. 
um, yeah, at some point, I think it will be, you know, like the, the AI that can generate uh, realistic photographs of people who don't exist is very impressive. And I think it's only a matter of time till that technology is applied to um, likenesses and sculptures and busts. Um, you know, I, I think that there's no replacement. Uh, so, I mean, one way you can think about doing this type of work is like as a product, right? And technology is always going to make it easier to make the final product. Um, but what technology can't replace is the, the joy that an artist gets from doing this kind of work. Because I actually love it. You know, it's fun for me to do this kind of work. And so how do you make a machine that replaces that? I don't know how you do that, right? You can't have machines that have fun for you. That doesn't make any sense. So, you know, maybe one day there will be like, you know how there's um, organic fair trade food and stuff now? Maybe there'll be like organic art, no AI involved. And uh, that'll be the, the more expensive art, right? So who knows? I'm a, I, I think I think people should keep doing art. I'm I'm kind of skeptical of you know these AI things that technically quote unquote make art for you. It's like why would you do that really? You know why would you give up the the joy and satisfaction of making art to a computer? Seems kind of silly to me. All right, so we're just about at the 10.30 mark. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, give this a save. And although there's probably some more things I'm gonna do to it, you know, it's, there's not a whole lot more to be done to this uh, before I'm ready to call it done. So uh, we're, let's say this bust is finished. Maybe I'll do a, a rendering in Keyshot or something, but that's outside the scope of uh, what this um, live stream is about. So. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining, and uh, really glad to have you here. Next week, we'll be doing a cartoony character. Uh, thank you, Gilad. Uh, and a oh, quick question, Zentoki, did I see the retopology modifier in 3ds Max? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, it, all this stuff, cool stuff that computers are doing are tools, uh, but they don't take the place of our imaginations. So keep those imaginations going and make some cool art you guys thanks a lot see you next week